friends in the coming series of lectures i will be dealing with the various uh, topics on uh, calcium homeostasis these topics include the calcium metabolism that would be my first lecture the, in the second lecture i will deal with the bone formation and bone maintenance in the third lecture i will discuss about the parathyroid hormone in the fourth lecture i will discuss about the vitamin d metabolite 125 cholecalciferol uh, in the fifth lecture i will talk i will discuss about the calcitonin and uh, lastly in the sixth lecture i will talk about the phosphate metabolism to start with the calcium metabolism outline of my lecture is as follows first i will discuss about the calcium the plasma levels of the calcium daily requirement and balance sheet of the calcium and dietary sources of the calcium very briefly i will touch upon these topics then absorption of calcium functions of calcium regulators of calcium and uh, brief mention on the hypocalcemic and hypercalcemic manifestations of calcium is a cation directly related with the phosphate and indirectly with the magnesium directly in the sense though it has a reciprocal relation with the phosphate but the calcium and phosphate they go hand in hand it is required for the strength of the bones and teeth trigger the neurotransmission the modulator of membrane potential and an essential component of the intra intracellular signaling molecule and is essential for life because uh, if the calcium levels uh, go low then there will be tetany and this tetany a laryngeal spasm and uh, this laryngeal spasm leads to asphyxia and death it is regulated by three specific hormones especially three dedicated hormones to regulate the calcium metabolism the parathyroid hormone the calcitriol that is a vitamin d and its metabolites 125 cholecalciferol and thirdly the calcitonin in addition it is in the the calcium metabolism is influenced by the all the major general metabolic hormones cortisol glucocorticoids growth hormone the thyroxin insulin and other other hormones which are regulating the metabolism the extracellular calcium concentration is de de decided or determined by the absorption of absorption from the intestine one and the excretion from the kidney and uh, the uptake and release that is the amount of uh, transfer from the bone that is uptake and release from the bone and all of these things are regulated or each one of them are regulated by the hormones dedicated hormones especially the pth calcitriol and calcitonin total body calcium is about 1100 gram 99% of it is present in the skeleton 1% of the total calcium is present intracellularly the major component major intracellular component goes to the skeletal muscles because the skeletal muscles comprises the uh, 40 to 50% of the body weight our body weight that is in the sarcoplasmic reticulum then plasma concentration that is in the ecf it is 0.1% it's only 0.1% 1% is in the intracellular uh, intracellular calcium in the plasma in the extracellular fluid it is 0.1% the plasma concentration of calcium is about 10 mg per deciliter or 5 ml equivalents per liter or 2.5 millimoles per liter nearly 50% of it is in the free form and 50% of it is in the bound form calcium is partially diffusible it is not freely diffusible you can just see the distribution of the calcium in the plasma so the ionized calcium is about 50 percent that is you can see that 1.2 millimoles so nearly 41 percent of it is bound to the proteins and a major protein which it is bound is the the albumin 
you can just see that uh, albumin binds a uh, uh, greater portion of the calcium. If you see that the plasma calcium is uh, 10 milligram per deciliter and you have a 5.36 5 is approximately 50% is uh, in the diffusion form and it is ionized. And uh, some of them are complex with the, the anions such as uh, uh, HCO3, citrate, and uh, some, some of them are with the phosphates. In the bound form, greatly to the albumin and greatly to, so then to the sec, uh, globulin. If you come back here, this is the same thing, same, same thing I have mentioned. 41% is to the protein bound and nearly 9% is complex with the anions, the bicarbonate and uh, citrates and the phosphate. This balance sheet of the calcium, you we usually in an, in an adult consumes nearly one gram of calcium per day. That is 1,000 milligram. Uh, 1,000 milligram is taken up uh, or ingested uh, orally. And once it is ingested, it enters the intestine, mainly in the duodenum and the first part of the intestine, it is being absorbed. And this absorption, nearly 350 milligram is absorbed and enters into the extracellular. This, that is in the blood and in the extracellular fluid. So now we have nearly 250 milligrams per day. Okay, just say that uh, it is in 35% is absorbed and 25% is given back. 25% is given back as a secretions from the various uh, uh, secretions of the GIT. That is the salivary secretions, the gastric secretions, the intestinal sec secretions, the pancreatic secretions, and so on and so forth. So that is about 250 milligram. The net calcium reaching the extracellular fluid is only 100, 100 milligram. You can just see that the 350 milligram is absorbed, 250 milligram is given back to the intestine. And once it is given back, of this, that means only 100 milligram is the net gain to the extracellular fluid. The nearly 900 milligram is excreted as a, as a complex calcium in the feces. That is the out. So that means only 100 milligram is gained. Now in the, this extracellular calcium, the calcium is filtered. 9,980 milligram is filtered. 9,880 milligram is reabsorbed in the pro proximal and the distal components. Mainly in the proximal tubules. And uh, the 100 milligram is excreted uh, through the urine depending upon the conditions. Now, the from the bone, there is some 500 milligram per day is added to the extracellular fluid, and 500 milligram is taken from this extracellular source. That means out of the 1300, so 500 milligram is good. So the nearly 13,000 milligram is present intracellularly. That is in equilibrium, equilibrium with the extracellular uh, calcium. That is all the balance sheet of the uh, calcium in our body. You can check these dietary sources in a number of literatures available. The most reliable literatures would be taken from the WHO or any other uh, nutritional journals. But however, I'm just trying to give you a rough idea about the dietary sources of the calcium or the dairy products mainly, the milk, curds, yogurts, cheese, and other dairy products. Amongst fruits and vegetables, custard fruit is rich in calcium. One custard fruit would give you around 1000 milligrams. Oranges, they are also rich and the apples with the external skin so they they will provide a greater calcium as compared to we have a radish broccoli spinach and other leafy vegetables they are the rich source of the uh, calcium other vegetables and fruits also give some amount of calcium but these are rich with the calcium and uh, some of the protein rich products like tofu soya milk and black beans they are the rich source of calcium Amongst the nuts and seeds, the almonds, chia seeds, and sesame seeds are the source of calcium. 
So that means uh, when you want to uh, prescribe it to a uh, person with a calcium deficiency, you have to look into these things. As we have discussed earlier, 1000 milligram is the daily intake in an adult. Calcium ions are not easily absorbed. They are poorly absorbed from the intestinal tract because they require a transporter, what is called a calbinding D, a transporter. Vitamin D promotes the calcium absorption, especially 1,2,5-cholecalciferol. That 1,2,5-dihydrocholecalciferol uh, promotes the calcium absorption from the enterocytes or from the intestinal cells. About 35% of the ingested calcium, as I mentioned earlier, is usually absorbed. 250 milligram is secreted or present in the secretions and in the sloughed mucosal cells of the intestine every day. Thus, 90% of the calcium taken, that is out of 1000 milligram, 900 milligram is excreted every day in the feces. Uh, this is uh, where we, we can think about the calcium is taken up by these, uh, the calcium, the, it comes through this uh, TRPV6 channel. This TRPV6 channel transport the calcium inside the cell. This is the uh, luminal border. And from here, this is a calbinding dark or calbinding D protein, which can associate, which can bind with the calcium. Now calcium binds with this calbinding D, Okay, then after binding with this uh, uh, transporter, some of the calcium is exchanged with the sodium through this sodium calcium exchanger system. That's the NCX1 uh, channel. So that means it is exchanged, 50% of it is exchanged through these things. And some of it is transported uh, in an energy dependent manner through this BMCA16 channels. This is an energy dependent channel and wherein magnesium is taken uh, for each uh, uh, calcium uh, transported. So you can see that enterocyte apical membrane TRP, this is a TRPV6 channel and uh, the, the expression levels of TRPV6 Calbinding D9K, this is a calbinding D9K, and PMCA1B, this one, and uh, upregulated by the 1,2,5-dihydrocholecalciferol, that is the active metabolite vitamin D. Okay, this is about the, so now various factors are influencing the uh, intestinal absorption of calcium. The calcitriol, parathormone, growth hormone, they promote or they increase the absorption. The low pH of the intestine would increase the absorption. You can think about if you are, if you are or low pH in the extracellular fluid that favor because that uh, uh, low pH in the intestine that would uh, increase the absorption. Usually the intestinal content is having nearly alkaline pH. Pregnancy lactation, that's a requirement, requirement, there is an additional requirement that would enhance the absorptive capacity of the intestine for calcium. Lactose, arginine, ar lactose, a carbohydrate, and amino acids, arginine and lysine, they promote the absorption. The oxalates and the pitates, they decrease the absorption of calcium. They form the calcium oxalate or calcium phytate uh, like, uh, precipitations or uh, chelations that would result in non-absorption of the calcium. The fatty diet, high fatty diet uh, that make that forms the calcium soaps so that calcium is not available for the absorption. The, the diet containing the high fiber that would uh, not allow the calcium availability because some of those fibers are getting attached. Some Sometimes uh, uh, that would not live because they will try to hold the calcium. Phosphates, high phosphate content of the lumen decrease the phosphate reabsorption. Alkalinity decrease the phosphate reabsorption. 
that means if you are looking at it, it will become more, more alkaline. So that then chronic kidney diseases where there is a decreased synthesis of 125 dihydrochloric cholecalciferol. So that dihydrochloricalciferol is necessary for entire calcium absorption, including the expression of those calcium binding protein and the TRPV6 receptors and the NCX and the uh, PMC uh, receptors. The lactose, again, that would decrease the absorption. That means lactose has a dual effect. One uh, may, be the depend may be depending upon the concentration. Now, what are the functions of the calcium? Needless to say that it is essential for the contraction of the skeletal, cardiac, and the smooth muscles. That's one part. And it is essential for the intracellular cytoskeletal structures that are tubulins and other things, uh, microfilaments, they also require calcium. The calcium is essential for blood clotting. If there is no calcium, the blood will not clot. Maybe at three levels of uh, the coagulation mechanisms, calcium is involved. Calcium is essential for the nerve transmission, wherein the calcium released because of the depolarization, the voltage-dependent calcium channels, the calcium enters the cells, and that will activate the recycle-associated membrane proteins. And that results in the recycle docking and uh, the exocytosis of the recycle. So that means the entire nerve transmission process, what are called the synaptogamin and synaptobravins, for all their actions, so that entire docking and release mechanisms, calcium is required. Then the vesicle transport and the transmitter release, calcium is required, as I was mentioning. Calcium is necessary for the excitability of the excitable membrane. It, you, you can just see that the excitability is inversely related with the calcium. So that means a low calcium level increases the excitability of the excitable membrane. And because of this increase, you will find that irritability, hyperexcitability, uh, titani, and the laryngeal spots. Those all things uh, you, will, you will see because of the hypocalcemia. Calcium is a component, one of the components of the intracellular uh, signaling molecules, especially the calcium calmodulin or intracellular calcium released because of the IP3 mechanisms or PLC IP3 mechanisms. Calcium is an essential component for uh, several enzymatic activity or for as a, a facilitator of the cellular enzymatic activity. Number eight. Calcium is essential for the cell division and growth. Cell division, where those uh, the cells in the mitosis they are pulled apart, those uh, things uh, is calcium is less required. Calcium is involved in thermoregulation. Now, maybe in the thermoregulation we have the prostaglandins and other things. Calcium is one of the cation along with other electrolytes uh, is regulating the. Uh, the temperature regulation or maintaining the temperature regulation. In the cardiac pacemaker potential, calcium is the transmitter. The whatever the pacemaker potential after the trigger, so you have the calcium, uh, it is through the calcium channels and the calcium uh, influx that produces that uh, wave of depolarization. And uh, you know the calcium is essential for bone and teeth formation that is apparent. Then you can see that calcium is necessary for memory, long-term potentiation, post-tetanic potentiation, post-tetanic in inhibitory, post-tetanic inhibition, and uh, you will see that number of other physiological mechanisms are involved by the calcium. So the list may be exhaustive. I have just added up 12 mechanisms. A contraction, blood clotting, transmission of impulses, vesicle transport, excitability, intracellular signaling, cellular enzymatic activity, cell division and growth, thermoregulation, cardiac pacemaker potential, bone and teeth, 
and the memory and other central neural, neural regulations. What are the regulators of calcium? We have two major regulators, the hormones and electrolytes. The hormones, there are dedicated hormones for the calcium metabolism, as I have mentioned. These are main regulators, primary regulators. The parathyroid hormone, 1, 2, 5 cholic dihydrocholecalciferol, vitamin D metabolite, and calcitonin. And secondary regulators are the metabolic hormones like glucocorticoids, growth hormone, thyroid hormones, estrogens, and androgens. These are secondary regulators. They will also alter the calcium uh, level in one or the other way. I will just briefly discuss about these points in my next slides. And other regulators are the electrolytes. The As I was mentioning, the absorption of the calcium and the calcium uh, ions, the free form of calcium ions, they are dependent upon the H ions the, in the plasma H ions. In case of alkalosis, there would be calcium deficiency because the albumin becomes the H ions attached with the albumin are discharged for the as a buffer mechanism, and calcium gets attached to the uh, albumin, forming a calcium albumin complex or a calcium proteinate complex. So that is why uh, H ions also regulate the calcium level, uh, free free form of calcium level depending upon the pH of the blood. So in alkalosis, uh, there will be tetany, and especially so when there is a respiratory alkalosis, as happens in case of the overbreathing or in case of a voluntary hyperventilation. And also the HCO3 ions, they will also determine the uh, calcium levels because that, fo that forms the alkalinity uh, in, in other terms. The magnesium, which is uh, oppo opposing the calcium levels, that also regulates the calcium levels. The phosphates and magnesiums, they almost play a si similar role. Uh, these uh, principal hormones are dedicated hormones. How they do, how they regulate the calcium. If you are looking at PTH, that's a parathyroid hormone, increases the plasma calcium level by mobilizing it from the bone. And in addition, it increases the calcium reabsorption from the kidney. So that means it decreases the, the calcium excretion. The more calcium is reabsorbed from the kidney. And it also increases the formation of this uh, 1, 2, 5 dihydro cholecalciferol, which is essential for the reabsorption of the calcium from the intestinal tract. So thus, in three ways, it tries to help. One, from the bone, it mobilizes. Two, from the kidney, it takes out extra. Three, it activates the 1,2,5-dihydrocholecalciferol so that more calcium is reabsorbed into the system. That's PTH. Now, 1,2,5-dihydrocholecalciferol, this is calcitriol, vitamin D, metabolite. And this performs in two ways. It increases the calcium absorption from the GIT, that's primary. From the GIT, it expresses all the calcium binding, calcium transporter system and the calcium uh, the channels and the whatever the transporters are involved. Secondly, it will be helping the calcium reabsorption from the kidney. Third point, 1,2,5-dihydrocholecalciferol has a permissive uh, action on the uh, PTH, PTH activity on the renal tubules. Calcitonin is a, another hormone which uh, uh, is regulating the calcium metabolism. Mm -hmm. It inhibits the bone resorption and increases the amount of calcium. in the urine, that means calcium excretion. So the, this, the calcitonin is released in response to the excess of uh, calcium. And uh, so when there is an excess of calcium, uh, calcium tries to, the, it will, the calcitonin tries to put the calcium back into the bone and it tries to uh, eliminate calcium from the uh, urine. The major feature of these glucocorticoids is they, low, they lower the uh, calcium levels. There are two effects, one acute effect and a chronic effect or a delayed effect. Acutely, it decreases the osteoclast formation and its activity. If the osteoclast formation 
uh, decreases the osteoclastic formation. That means uh, more calcium is uh, deposited. Chronically uh, produces osteoporosis that goes in the reverse direction. Decreases bone formation and increases bone resorption. And uh, the decreases bone formation by inhibiting the protein synthesis in the osteoblasts. So that means it has a metabolic effect on the osteoblasts in which it decreases the bone formation. And uh, it decreases the absorption of a calcium and a phosphate from the intestine. And also increases the renal excretion of calcium. Decreases the plasma calcium concentration and increases the PTH facilitates uh, bone resorption. These are all the major things. So that means uh, in a long range, uh, there will be a bone resorption and uh, there is a osteoporosis and uh, maybe you may find uh, in a person with a uh, Cushing's syndrome, that means who are in a long range, they may have a, uh, the bones may not be stronger. They may easily fracture also. So then how about growth hormone? That is the second hormone. So growth hormone increases the calcium excretion in the urine. Growth hormone uh, increases the absorption of a calcium, absorption of a calcium. Action two, that is the absorption of a calcium is greater than the excretion of calcium in the urine. So net growth hormone produces the net positive cal calcium balance. So that means uh, the number one, so you just see that number one is the excretion in the urine and GIT absorption. If you see that XN2 is greater than XN1, hence there is a negative positive calcium balance. It activates, uh, the growth hormone activates this uh, insulin-like growth factor one and stimulates the protein synthesis of bone so that uh, the calcium is uh, deposited there. That is how the growth hormone that, in that increases the calcium. Thyroid hormones may cause hypercalcemia, hypercalciuria, and in some instances, osteoporosis. Hypercalcemia, hypercalciuria, that means eliminating calcium. And eliminating calcium, that produces the, the osteoporosis. Estrogen prevent osteoporosis by inhibiting the stimulatory effects of uh, certain interleukins and uh, cytokines on the osteoclasts. So that means uh, estrogen supposes that uh, uh, these things are that, uh, that prevent osteoporosis. That is why after menopause, the estrogen is uh, reduced, estrogen levels are reduced, and hence this preventive aspect or inhibitory aspect on osteoporosis are missing. So then uh, the uh, osteoporosis sets in. Similarly, the androgens, but they will come in the later stage. They will also have a similar uh, effect on the uh, bone formation. Insulin increases the bone formation as a metabolic hormone and uh, in untreated uh, diabetes mellitus there is a significant bone loss. These are some of the hormones. Uh, I, have, I have not mentioned here androgens. Androgens also play a role in the uh, bone formation. So these are some of the manifestations of the hypo and hypercalcemia. The first thing is here, I have mentioned, I have shown the here carpopedal spasm, two, two, three things. That means one is a, uh, the one carpopedal spasm after maybe you may have a frank spasm or after applying the uh, blood pressure cough, that's a trousseau sign that becomes a positive. That's called a titani. This titani is because of the hypocalcemia and hypocalcemia increases the excitability of the nerve. And if the excitability of the nerve is there, neuromuscular transmission is increased. So usually we are under the impression that hypocalcemia should decrease the bone uh, muscle contraction. No, hypocalcemia because of the increased excitability, uh, the it increases the transmission and increases the whatever the excitation contraction coupling happens. We have an enormous amount of uh, uh, calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and that calcium is released for the spasm. Mm -hmm. So that is the uh, titani. That is the uh, 
The next part, okay, titani is fine. Titani we can treat, we can replace with this thing. The another part is that it produces the muscle spasm. We they, The muscles go into spasm because of the, the increased uh, excitability of the muscles. And especially the laryngeal muscle spasm uh, produces a, what is called uh, the asphyxia. And uh, if the asphyxia continues, for more than a minute or so, or more than one or two minutes, death may uh, ensue. So that is why laryngeal spasm is an important thing. When there is a hypocalcemia, we, it's, it's a short of emergency we have to treat. And this happens, uh, usually 10 milligram per deciliter is the, the, um, the amount of uh, calcium, uh, normal amount. If it falls below eight and below seven, there will be titani and a laryngeal spasm below seven milligram per deciliter. And it may produce coagulation defects because of the decreased, but uh, they, they, that would that should be almost uh, the uh, calcium level should be too low, too low, even small amount is will, will be able to. But before that, the laryngeal spasm is an important uh, thing. Hyperexcitability, irritability, restlessness are the nervous uh, system manifestations of the hypocalcemia. In the long range, they produce because of the calcium is not there. The calcium is taken out from the bone. The osteomalacia and the rickets and the osteoporosis may be seen. The bone becomes weaker and sparse. There is less calcium deposits in the bone. Then hypercalcemia. Hypercalcemia is also another condition. This decreases the excitability, hypoexcitability, and uh, there would be a depression. It enhances the stone formation, the stone formations in the, in the kidney, that means the calcium phosphate or calcium oxalate stones, they may be formed, or stone formation in the biliary tract. So you may find uh, these that will enhance because they get precipitated depending upon the nature of the other uh, uh, anions present. These are the manifestations of the hypocalcemia and hypercalcemia. In the next class, I will take up the bone formation and uh, bone uh, maintenance, because that is essential for understanding the entire calcium metabolism. And uh, that is as I have scheduled, as I have given in my schedule of lectures. Thank you. Uh, leave your comments and uh, subscribe to the channel. And I would be happy to answer all your questions. Thank you.